it's Justin and we have a very special episode of Community During Chaos today. Uh, we are going to speak about the Nigerian crisis right now. You may have seen the hashtag um, NSARSNow, um, SARS must go. Uh, there's a lot of police brutality and crazy issues going on in Nigeria and today we are going to speak to three Nigerians about it. Um, first up, we're going to have Limo Blaze, then, excuse me, as I'm typing this in. First up, we're going to have Limo Blaze, then we're going to have our Rapzilla writer, Alusola. And then, closing out the show, we're going to have Chopay. So, here we go. So again, this is Community During Chaos. Every week, every Monday, I speak to three different people within the CHH community. And we talk about the craziness of 2020 and everything that's been going on. And just how we can come up with solutions and, and you know, have answers to these problems. Like, everyone's at a loss for words. Everyone doesn't know what to do. But everyone's also going through the same thing. So today, we're taking those problems outside of the United States. And we're going over to Nigeria where they are dealing with their own crisis right now. Um, so we're going to be speaking to Limo Blaze and Alusola, who's actually, who are actually there. And then Chopay, who's a Nigerian who currently lives in Canada. And uh, shout out to my man, legend for the hat, friend of the show, and the shirt as well. Um, okay, so let's see if Limo Blaze is in here now. I know it's super late by you, I'm sorry, or super early, depending on how you want to call it. I mean, yeah, it's about 2 a.m. down here. Oh, man, sorry. I know uh, these these time zones are tricky, but you're an artist. You guys you guys don't sleep anyway. <laughs> yeah, 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 you got that right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just interrupting a writing session, I'm sure. But man... <laughs> Man, uh, how are you? I'm excited to to talk to you for the first time. I've posted your music so many times. Um, and I just, I know it's a crazy time going on over there right now. So we wanted to get this episode uh, kickstarted to, to kind of discuss, because a lot of us, you know, uh, America is very America-centric. We only know about our own problems and we can't even handle our own problems. Yeah. So it's good to hear some some other perspectives from people around the world. Um, so, I mean, the first thing I would ask you before we really dive into the SARS and everything that's going on is what's it been like in Nigeria, even with the COVID and just kind of the, the craziness that's been going on uh, with this pandemic? Uh, well, I, I mean, I mean, also, uh, first of all, it's amazing being able to like have this conversation with you for the first time and I mean, big shout out to you, big shout out to Rob Zilla for you guys have supported my music for so many years now. Thank you. And yeah. On, on a personal level, I am good. And but how things have been in Nigeria over the past, I mean, before the escalation of the SARS issue, over mm -hmm. the past six, seven months with COVID and everything, man, it's been crazy. It's been, it's been crazy uh, because the dynamics of the situation in Africa is it's always different from what it is in the U.S. At, at yeah. least we, we, we get, to, we, we get to, to feed from the media what it is like in the United States of America. And it's, it's, it's a whole different dynamic down here, man, because yeah. healthcare-wise, we are... We're talking about two completely different worlds, man. Two mm -hmm. completely different worlds. The the healthcare system here is almost in existence. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't even want to say it is. It is. It's fun. It's it's almost in existence. And with COVID, with the COVID situation, I feel like it is a situation where I would want to say. I'll probably want to say God was particularly uh, helpful to Africans because mm -hmm. we are we were not ready we were not ready for a situation like COVID. I right. Mean, I mean, the United States of America and other countries, and across even in Europe, 
where probably they had the facility to be able to to try to contain a situation like the COVID. Here in Af in Nigeria and Africa across, we were not ready, man. We were not ready. So the the way COVID situation happened in Nigeria, it it was kind of mild, I would say. Because if it was like what we, we heard in the news of how it was in the US and other countries, I really did not know what would have been of this region, man. So I, I, I feel like, I mean, God just leveled the, the playing field for us. Mm -hmm. And so we, we COVID, the, the situation out here with COVID is definitely not what it was out there because there weren't so many casualties down here. So for Nigeria, for example, all we knew was in every single day in the news, you would hear that there were figures of people who were tested positive for COVID. Right. But this is the crazy thing about the situation in Nigeria is that you could almost not tell of anybody who knew anybody who had COVID. Wow. To date, to date, <laughs> this is over seven months, I don't know anybody who had COVID. I don't know That's anybody crazy. who knew anybody who had COVID. Down here, it felt, the situation with COVID felt very political. It felt like it was just a thing the government was using to, to, to loot funds and divert money. Because it was every day, you just hear, oh, 70 something people tested positive, uh, 100 people tested. I mean, in, I, I feel like it, all, outside the country, there are other countries where people were actually being named. And you could tell that, oh, so and so person had COVID. There was never any naming of anybody who had COVID. Nobody knew anybody who had COVID. Wow. It's interesting. Yeah, I mean, in here, here, people still go out to, to like various business centers with a mask. But the reason people go out with a mask, it's not necessarily because you are scared of being infected. People only go out with a mask here mostly because you might not be allowed into the venue or into the business center. So, right. I, the way we, we are moving and living out here, nobody really has a fear for COVID. Nobody does. And to date, some persons here in Nigeria will tell you they don't think there was COVID in Nigeria. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd imagine, I, I'm in New York City, so, yeah. you know, that's that's a hub. People are flying in and out and going. Yeah. But, you know, is Nigeria a place that's like, are there people coming in and out of Nigeria like that? Like crazy of or, yeah. Of course, of course, there are people. I mean, when when COVID started globally, uh, one of the, the the errors the country made was they didn't immediately lock down the airspace. Like people were still coming into the country. I mean, in in other countries, I remember when COVID started, they actually had like a lockdown that prevented people from coming into the country. Right. Down here, the citizens were actually the ones begging the government for several weeks to shut down and nothing nothing happened because people were still flying in and until the point where it was reported we had the first case and then, yeah, things are... But right now, things are almost back to normal, completely back to normal. People are coming into Nigeria. People are leaving Nigeria. I mean... They would say there are there are steps that were laid in place to be able to curtail what is happening, but yeah, people people are coming into Nigeria, especially a city like Lagos, which is like uh, the business biggest hub in Africa, in all of Africa. Yeah, people are still chopping in and out of Lagos. Yeah, that's interesting. It, you know, it's kind of becoming normal for us now over here too after what it's okay. been like seven seven months already yeah you know everyone everyone wears the mask and everything because we're mandated yeah. too um but uh, new york was hit particularly hard i think i think we had like two hundred thousand cases or something like that i did know a few people who had it uh, yeah. so i was actually on lockdown for like three months but it's it's interesting to hear like Nigeria was kind of just open and, and people really didn't get it. I think that's pretty, it's yeah, pretty wild. I mean, we, we had a period when we were on lockdown. Yeah, we also were on lockdown for a while. But I mean, 
I, I, I don't mean to sound like some of those persons who probably sound uneducated about the situation, but I, I really feel like if, if it was how the media was portraying it here in Nigeria, it's kind of, I mean, you being in the U.S., right, I'm sure you know a number of persons who were infected. Right. A couple I'm of sure. uh, guys in CHH, a couple of guys in CHH yeah, had it. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you have friends who could say, I know at least one person who was infected. Fam, I do not know at least one person <laughs> who was. And wow. I do not have any friends who could tell you to know anybody who was. And it was, it was just a situation of numbers being thrown to us every single day. It was like, yo, you just go on the news at the end of the day. Oh, 200 persons tested positive. That, that's all we yeah. can get them. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's wild. Um, so, let, so let's move on to, to the big topic, the, yeah. the SARS topic, which for anyone who doesn't know, is a special anti-robbery unit yeah. squad um, yeah. in, in Nigeria. Um, so over here, we had, you know, the death of George Floyd that kind of sparked yeah. the whole Black Lives Matter movement yeah. um, globally. Like it, you guys even got it over there, like just yeah. that, that yeah. movement. So what was kind of your George Floyd moment that kicked off this whole, this whole thing for, for you guys? Yeah, I, I think for us, it was, it was a lot of moments leading together to that one mm -hmm. big breaking point where everybody was like, no, we've had enough of this. So the, the SARS unit, first of all, what people need to understand about SARS is Going by what the SARS is supposed to be about, mm -hmm. these guys are not even supposed to be on the streets of the country. They are the special anti-robbery squad. Right. Now, I don't know much about the American policing uh, system, but I want, to, I want to assume the SWAT is not going to be on the road handing speeding tickets to people. I, I, uh well, no, our police definitely give yeah. out speeding tickets for people, but it's yeah. I, they don't necessarily. I would say like, like yeah. that's what they're doing all day. Yeah. So uh, what I'm what I'm saying is, I feel like so I don't know much about the policing system in the U.S., but I feel like the SWAT is like a special unit of of the police force. But well, these guys are supposed to be a special. The SARS is, are supposed to be a special unit that shows up in, in situations of robbery and mm -hmm. like really high security cases. That is what, that is supposed to be their jurisdiction. But over the decade, these guys, you find these guys on the streets of- Okay. Yeah. And what they do on a daily basis is they harass people, they, they kill like a lot. Personally, I've, like every, it's, it's impossible to be a young person in the country and have not had an experience with these guys. Personally, I have had my experience. I have been arrested by these guys. The reason why I was arrested by these guys was because I had beards, like beards, like literally I had beards and I was driving a new car. That was the sole reason why I was arrested. I was pulled over. Like it was crazy. It was because you looked good. Because you looked like you were put yeah, together. Literally, literally, once you look good, you're immediately a target. I was just driving and these guys like just drove in front of me, jumped out of their vehicles, had guns pointed at me, told me to stop the car, told me to get off the car and took me. So anybody being in that situation, witnessing it, you would think I was a criminal. Yeah. The way I was treated, I was I was arrested like a, like a common criminal in the middle of like the city, thrown into a vehicle, taken to the station. This is a regular thing for these guys. The moment you look good, they see you. It, it's it's something about profiling. They see you as a young person who looks good, and you're immediately profiled to be a criminal. And it is so crazy because there hasn't been any sort of accountability with this system, yeah. with this unit of the police. They, they, they harass people, they kill people. Mm -hmm. Like there have been several, 
I, I don't want to just throw figures out there, but I'm sure in the past 10 years, there have probably, probably been over 5,000 deaths probably wow. related to these guys. And I mean, there were, se there were several situations. It, you were not supposed to be pulled over by a police officer and he tells you to open your phone that he wants to go through your phone. These guys do this. They see you on the, on, the, on the way. They ask you to open your phone. You can't even question them. It's, 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 and then the crazy thing about it is we've seen information about how these guys are recruited. And one of the scary part is most of the guys in this unit are ex-convicts, like criminals who the government called and gave guns to. Wow. These guys are not educated in, most of these guys are not educated in any way. There isn't any sort of due process. Uh, there, is, there have been several situations of where these guys meet you on the way. Like, this is, this is a regular happening. They meet you on the way, stop you. They will arrest you, take you to an unknown location. They will threaten to kill you. They will tell you, these guys will tell you they're going to kill you and nobody will do anything about it. And yes, they do that. They kill people and nobody does anything about it. So they take you to an unknown location, threaten you, take all your money, take you to an ATM, withdraw all your money and leave you stranded, beat you up. There have even been several situations of people who were, were announced as missing by their families and their families didn't know that these guys were in some SARS prison somewhere. They arrest you, they don't even, there isn't like a proper uh, case scenario. Like a record, like a yeah, record, like a database. Yeah, there's no, there's no database. There's nothing of that nature. So people could actually get arrested. And I, I, I've heard of stories of, of people who were in a prison for several months. Their families were going crazy looking for them. They didn't know where they was, but they were in some SARS police station. Wow. Up, without any, no, let's, the, the, the crazy part about it is the fact that there is zero accountability. The government do not question these guys. So it's almost like these guys are a unit that do whatever they want. Yeah. So they're, they're the bad guys. Yeah. Several persons have lost their lives due to this unit. And even to date, even after all the protests and everything that has happened, nobody has been brought to book. No single SARS police officer has been brought to book. There hasn't been a single case of, okay, this person killed this person extrajudicially and this person has been charged to court. There hasn't been a single case of that nature. So no justice has been meted out in any way. Now, are, are there actual regular police in Nigeria too? Like just regular everyday police officers? Yeah, there are regular everyday police officers, but the whole system is messed up. The whole system, the whole policing system in Nigeria needs a total reform. Yeah. Because even those, even those guys, the ones who are regular police officers, they are also doing the most on the streets every day. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 a cra it's crazy because like in recent times. Most of us got to, to be exposed to what, what the, the police system was, what the, the, the salary of these guys are. So I, it's a total reform that needs to happen. The police are not being well paid. Right. Now, this is, this, is not, this is not me trying to make an excuse for them. I am not trying to make an excuse for them. But in, in, in light of recent activities, we've been able to see that the police are so underpaid so so underpaid there isn't there isn't uh proper provisions for these guys the stations are messed up uh the working conditions are messed up everything is just messed up but yes they're regular police officers who are also doing the most like they all need a total reform man yeah so over here like our our SWAT units and our our special units like that like they're brought in for like a when you think of the movies, like a terrorist situation or, yeah, yeah, you that, know, that, that, that was a bill, like the there's, start. there's hostages, there's, you know, something, you know, they'll exactly. send in the SWAT team. Um, exactly. But no, they're not, they're not just walking around. Like the SWAT team is like a special, 
thing, like one out of yeah. every 500 calls or something like that. Yeah, that, that was what I was trying to say at the start when I, I mentioned the stuff. Yeah. They're supposed to be a special unit. That is yeah, what these yeah. guys are supposed to be, but these guys are not. These guys are on the road every day. As a matter of fact, I don't think any Nigerian knows of a robbery situation where these guys were of any help. The, the only thing we know them for is being on the streets every day, terrorizing young people, shooting at young people. I mean, it's a nightmare, man. It's, it's, it's such a nightmare. It is so bad that as a young person, if I'm driving on the streets of Lagos, yeah, and I see a police officer ahead of me, I become scared. Yeah. Like, do, do, do you understand? You are not scared of, of, armed, of armed criminals. Like, you see a police officer who is supposed to be protecting you, and you immediately become scared. That is what the situation is like. Here. Mm -hmm. I, me, me, me being me being an artist. As on a, on a regular day, there, there is a way I might want to dress as, as an artist. But out here, I have to to like really curtail how I dress because I don't want to look too flashy. I don't want to look like I got so much money and stuff. Because you you gotta look like you're broke. You gotta look like you're broke to minimize the interactions with these guys. So yeah, it's what it yeah, is. that's okay, that's the total opposite. Over here, like when you hear of racial profiling or you hear of profiling, you see this yeah. person, you know, they got the hoodie. They, you know, maybe yeah. to you, they, they look a little sketchy or whatever. And like, oh, that yeah. guy's a criminal. But over there in Nigeria, it's like, no, that's how we want, you know, people to look. And yeah. if they're dressed nice and they're put together, they're probably up to no good. Right. So the assumption is that what you're like a drug dealer or you're like you're making money illegally some way and yeah. that's that's why you're well put together yeah I, I, the, the the most common assumption is uh the profiling they always do is you are probably an internet fraudster that's 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 the easiest profiling to do in mm -hmm. now there, it's there is there's a lot of miscommunication along the lines of I mean, if, if you watch a lot of American movies, it's very easy for you to come across lines of where Nigerians are being referred to as cameras and stuff like that. And why there are a few Nigerians, why there are Nigerians who engage in internet scam and stuff like this? Yeah. This is just a tiny percentage of the population. Right. It's just a few bad eggs who are making the rest of the people look bad. Mm -hmm. Nigerians are very hardworking. Nigerians are, are some of the most hardworking persons in Africa. They are very hardworking. And it comes from, most of this comes from a place where the generation before us, which is, which is most, most of the guys who also make up the police, have this assumptions of uh, the only way to make money is to have a nine to five job. That was like mm -hmm. that was like the common that was like the common practice. Only people who have nine to five jobs are supposed to be able to to be able to own a car. But I mean, man, the times have shifted. The times have shifted. There are a lot of young Nigerians who necessarily do not have a nine to five. There are a lot of young Nigerians who are graphic designers who are making a ton of money online just by being online and providing uh, their right. services online. There are a lot of it's a new industry. Who, yeah, there are a lot of Nigerians who, who are out there who are into forex trading. Forex, now, forex trading is a thing that is common amongst the youths like out here. Mm -hmm. They make a lot of money from forex trading, man. Uh, myself, I'm an artist. I make music. Uh, this is what I do. If I probably get stopped by a police officer and I say I'm an, I'm an artist, one of two things is, is, I mean, I've been stopped before and I said I'm an artist and I had to like prove, I had to show them my pages for them to understand that, yeah, I'm an artist because yeah, just you being a young guy, you're not even supposed to be able to eat. It's almost like it's a situation where they can't comprehend how you are young and you don't have a nine to five and you have a car. Yeah. 
they yeah. can't fathom success outside of you know exactly. what what they think it looks like. Yeah, yeah, they can't fathom success outside what they think is is the status quo of what where they're coming from of how you hear police officers say stuff like I mean I've, I've seen several situations where an officer a police of, officer will say stuff like I've been I've been in the police force for over ten years I'm not able to afford a phone that costs two hundred thousand how can you a, a young boy be able to afford this kind of phone. Fam, out here, if you own an iPhone, you are immediately profiled as a criminal for owning an yeah, iPhone. Yeah, I saw that. Yep. It's crazy. An iPhone is not a gun, man. Like, personally, I'm, I'm personally holding off from owning the latest iPhone devices because I know if I, it's, it's, if I own them and I get stopped by the police, it's going to be like a lot going on. So I probably just manage the, the older versions of the iPhone, the iPhone 7 and the iPhone 8, just to be able to avoid this situation. So at, at the end of the day, though, what, what, is the, what is the solution and what needs to happen like, and what can be done immediately? Because I know they've been talking about this for years yeah. and years and, yeah. and they just kind of keep, yeah, yeah, we're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. And, yeah. and they don't. Yeah. So I, I this the, the 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 fact that we've been talking about this for for several years and nothing has been done is also why the the recent events escalated. I don't know if you heard about what was termed the Les Lekki massacre. I don't know because the the government has tried the government has tried so much to block a lot of this from going out like to the international mm -hmm. space to try to limit it a lot. And you are aware of the protest and everything that has happened in the past uh, few weeks here in Nigeria. Uh, young people all around the country, God came together. This is the first time this is happening. Young people in the country coming together, saying enough is enough. Mounting the streets every single day. And, but it, it took a sad turn of events on the 20th of October where the government called a curfew as a beat to, to shut down the protest, a call the curfew. And the young people in my city where I stay in Lagos State defied the curfew. And on the 20th of October, sad, it's a sad event that happened. People in, people outside of the Nigerian space probably do not know about it. But 20th of October, the military came to one of the protest grounds where young people refused to, to go home and they still mounted the streets and opened fire on, on armed citizens. It is called, it's, I mean, if you go on Wikipedia and search Lekki Massacre, you will get like a lot of information about it. I wasn't there on the ground, but I was tuned into the Instagram live of one of the persons who was present there and we could see people being shot, shot at. So it's almost like this is supposed to be a, a democracy, but it's almost like we are under some sort of dictatorship because the government is not listening. It's almost like we got to a point where the, the end of October almost man because mm -hmm. like people died. People died for what? For protesting, for asking for what is, is their rights. And so we are really in a place where we're trying to understand what our next line of action is. Because man, we have protested, they have said they hate us, but I mean, in the course, during the protest, the government came out and said, the SARS unit has been disbanded. That is what they said. But as I speak to you till today, these guys are still on the streets. They just called something else now, right? Now they're just yo, called the yo, SWAT they unit. They gave them a new name. They gave them a new name. They called them SWAT. <laughs> They called them SWATs, man. Yeah. They called them SWATs, which was crazy because that is an insult to the name SWAT in general, man. <laughs> yeah. Because, no. Nah. But this, this guys are still on the streets till today harassing people, beating people up, stealing from people. And the, the way forward right now, I think the conversations that the young persons are beginning to have is, okay. yo, it is time for us to get into politics. It is time for us to infiltrate the political system, really be a part of it so we, we could be able to make these decisions that really matter 
for ourselves. And yeah, I feel like that is that that is the light at the end of the tunnel that we are hoping towards. Because other than that, man, I don't really know. Because after the 20th of October, we, we all got to a place where we were all broken. We were mm-hmm. all really broken. And and, and then the, the president finally gave a speech <laughs> days after. And the speech did not address the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room, which was why we are innocent citizens gone down. The president did not address that till today. Nobody is taking responsibility for it. And a lot of funny things are just happening. <sighs> really, man, that's just, that's, just, that's just where we're at. And how, how close in proximity is all this happening to you? Man, uh, like the past one week, the past one week, in the, my city where I'm at, there has been a lot of unrest happening. 15 minutes away from me, a 15 minutes drive away from me, a whole community was burnt down with several people, wow. several persons killed. Like 15 minutes away from me, several persons were killed. Community was burnt down. So this isn't a, this isn't a situation of, oh, yo, this is so far. No, it isn't far from me, man. Like all of so it's a problems. countrywide, it's a countrywide problem, not yeah. just the major city of, of Lagos. Yeah, man, this is, this is, this is totally, it's a countrywide thing. It's happening mm-hmm. everywhere in the country. It might be, it might be list in the Northern parts of the country, but yeah, it is happening everywhere in the country, everywhere, every, every single, I don't, I don't know if there's any young person in Nigeria who hasn't experienced wow. police brutality in a way. I don't think there is anyone who hasn't. I've had my fair share of it. All right, man. So I don't want to keep you too much longer. So what would be your your final word or your final thoughts about this whole thing? Uh, So for me, man, like uh, during the whole situation, I I had specific instructions from God. And the specific instruction I had was to pray. And when all of this was going on, I and the friends came together and organized what was called a prayer walk, uh, where we just we, we get up from day to day in different cities and just come on the streets of like the, the country and just pray. And it, it was in so to us it wasn't a protest. We were not protesting. The only if if, if I want to call it a protest, I would call it a spiritual warfare or sort of. Uh, but for most people, it was people saw that as a way of protesting, and it it is it is really we're really in a place where we have all really begin to to realize that the battle we are fighting is is one that only God can win for us, man. Because we have done everything that we thought was like the the physical effort we can put into it, and we ended up we ended up in a with a slap in the face, man. Uh, so. The last word for me is everybody out here and even out there in, in the U.S. and stuff should really just help us pray and also help bring light in to the situation of what is happening. Because out here, the government tries a lot to like suppress all of that information and yeah. help yeah. go out. And so when all of this was go- was going on, we tried we tried a lot to like get like a lot of people outside the country to talk about it. So if, because we understand that if there was an international pressure coming into the government, they would be forced to want to like act, to save face. I mean, when all of this was happening, I was in talks with a few persons. I was, I was in talks with Truth, uh, the Truth. And I mean, he lent his voice and like putting the word out there. I remember sending yeah. tweets out to KB, who also put a word out there to Governor B. Uh, I was in talk with, with, with Ace, Ace and Reach Records and he, yeah, Ace Ace was Ace was really he he was one person who was really concerned about what was happening. He was really in touch because like he went back and forth with me. He really wanted to know what was happening on ground and yeah, they had their own way of like lending in their voice. Lecrae also lent his voice uh, to and all of that just really helps when people outside of the space are talking about it because the government likes to save face. They like to 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 
to to seem to the international community as like they're doing something. Yeah, so once that pressure keeps coming out from outside, yeah, there would be... I mean, the governor of Lagos State had to have an interview with CNN today. He had an interview with CNN today, and it was because people had called the attention of CNN. And it was, it was so crazy because the interview he had with CNN and the interview he had with the Nigerian media were totally two different dynamics. Yeah. His interviews with the Nigerian media, it was that of, okay, I'm the boss. You cannot question me. I say whatever I want to say. I detect the narrative. What we saw clearly today, the interview with CNN, he could not do that because the league, like, they literally shut him down. If he wants to, to dilly-dally around the question, it goes simply, it's a yes or no question. And with, with the international media, it's a totally different dynamic. He just has to answer. They have to, 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 to answer the, to pay, to, to really pay, to really just treat, to, to, to answer the big question, the, the elephant yeah. in the room. So we, we need a lot of that happening, man. We need a lot of, of international uh, bodies really just weighing in and making the government act. We need that. A lot. All right, man. Um, I'm gonna let you go. I want to get to Alisol. I know it's so late by you guys. Yeah. Where where could everyone uh, follow you and and keep track of everything that you're doing, real quick? Oh, uh, yeah, man. Uh, Instagram at limoblaze underscore limoblaze is spelled L I M O B L A Z E. I mean, you can see it on the live. So Instagram limoblaze underscore uh, Twitter at limoblaze, Facebook limoblaze. I oh, mean, my music is everywhere, man. YouTube, uh, Apple Music, Spotify, Deezer. I make a lot of Afro beats music. Yeah. All right, man. Dope. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, you know, spreading some knowledge. You know, I I yeah. I did some research before this, but. You know, I knew that I really didn't have any idea of the depth of what was going yeah. on. So I appreciate you sharing that because I feel like probably much of our audience hasn't either. Um, so yeah. my prayers, my prayers are with you guys and and stay Thank safe you, out there, man. All right. So that was Limo Blaze. We're going to go. A man on the street, literally, uh, Rabzilla writer, Alus Sola, he, he lives out there. And uh, I couldn't have actually put this episode together without him. So let me go live with him. Man, I, I wanted to, to to thank you so much for helping me set this up and and getting Limo Blaze and, and kind of putting the, the the gears in motion here. Uh, I know it's super late for you, so I yeah. appreciate I appreciate you jumping on with me. Um, so kind of kind of the. I know, I know Limo Blaze answered some of these questions. So if anyone maybe has some specific questions in the comments they want to ask, that would be cool. Uh, my, my thought first, before we get into some of that is you're in a Rapzilla chat yeah. uh, with a bunch of Americans and you are the only non-American in there. So, you know, what's it like to, to hear us dealing with our uniquely American problems that, that we deal with? And, you know, do you do people in Nigeria have a general understanding of, of what's happening in the U.S. or is it, you know, more centralized than what's going on over there? OK, yeah, first of all, privileged to be the only non-American person like in Nigeria. <laughs> it makes <laughs> you, know, you special. It can it can it can be some kind of work, you know, um, going back and forth. Um, and again, your chats. You know, sometimes when you guys chat, you might be in the morning over there, and um, it's right over here. So putting up with chats might be a hard thing to do, but it's really been a nice one, though. Like it's more like a family thing over there, and I really, really love the fact that you guys are trying your best to put me in the family. I really love that. Yeah. So um, to your question, yeah. Um, most things that happen in um in America over there. We definitely know about it. Like, let me say 80, 90% of it. Wow. Yeah, yeah, because we have the likes of CNN, here, Fox News, and the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So all these stations keep us 
updated on things happening in the country over there. So we're definitely aware of it. Yeah, so you know about all the craziness and all, a lot, oftentimes the silliness and the controversy that we go through. And you guys are, are having like a crisis over there. And now finally, you know, the U.S. is like, oh, what's what's going on in, in Nigeria? Because as I, I was I was telling Limo Blaze, we're so like centra, centric on what on what we're doing. And, and we don't realize that, you know, our broadcast and, you know, our movies and our music is, is going all over the world. And we're not necessarily getting any of that back. Um, so it, it's an interesting dynamic that I definitely wanted to ask you about. Now, you know, what what can we do people outside of Nigeria to to make a difference for what's going on there now? You know, I, I've seen a lot of support by us and Limo Blaze was saying, you know, Lecrae and KB, but can we actually do anything over here to help you guys? Uh, so far, the international community has been tremendous in their effort, I must say. Like the youths in Nigeria never imagined this protest and the whole of it would go this far, I believe. Mm. No one really imagined it would really go this far. And people in part of Europe and other parts of the world were here of this. You know, it's it's really been a great achievement, you know. Even mm -hmm. though even though a lot of times they've been silenced and the rest of it. They've been resilient and stood on their words, and it's it's really been a good thing. So far, in amplifying their voice, people have been using social media in amplifying their voice and let other persons know about what is going on. Yeah, some other things we can also do, I believe, is to educate people around us, like people outside there can educate each other. Mm -hmm. And um, beyond that, I think so far people are also trying to donate to victims. You know, some persons were killed. Like I was reading the news today and um, I saw that over 30,000 persons have been killed so far by the SARS unit. Wow. Or close to 30,000 persons. Since it started? Yeah, I think so. I think that was what I read online. You know, and to me that so all those persons now definitely have families. You understand? Mm -hmm. Some of them might be breadwinners, some of them might be the only child. You understand that? So um so I think there are ways to donate. Some persons have been donating to for different courses to different families, you know. So people can also help with that other than amplifying your voice. So if you feel you might not be able to help financially, you can help in amplifying through the social media, talking about it, using the hashtags, let people get more aware, you know, yeah. It's now, it's mostly men and boys, right? Do they, do they yeah. go after women or? Some of them do go after women. Some of them do go after women. Like, I've been a victim of it, you know, and uh, it was really a scary thing for me though. Um, but I've had cases of women also, being victims you know they do all sorts to them and even um about them and the rest of it so it's 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 both male and female but it's it's more on the high side for the male now if, if you don't mind sharing what what happened to you oh, okay so it was just me getting to my house and next thing they picked me up you understand just for going into your house. Uh, and set my phone, asked what I was doing. Yeah, but they later left me though, after they didn't find anything implicating. Wow. So what what would have been implicate like implicating for you? It just like what Limo Blaze said, yeah, it's very, very correct. You know, they believe there is oh I mean the belief over here is if you are young and good looking if you are yeah young and good looking looking successful dress well look good the belief is you're possibly an internet foster so that's the general belief the mentality right. they offer you and um 
just like Limo said again, everyone can be doing a nine to five job, you know. Some mm -hmm. person can be doing a nine to five job, but living well, doing Lego jobs. So that's something they are led, you know, it's 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 some form of miseducation or misinformation, I would call it, on their own side. They they are still having that archaic mentality that you know what, you have to work so so much before you can look good. You have to work so so much before you can drive the best cars. And um that is not supposed to be so. So are you are you close to Limo Blaze or are you in a totally different area than him? Um we are in the same states but in different cities. I think he is in the capital city like okay. states, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So mine is where I stay is a bit further, like let me say an hour drive from where he is, I guess. Okay. So like over here, obviously there there's tons of police officers. We we've had issues with police brutality, but I know police officers and I know good police officers. Do you actually know anybody that works in the SARS unit? I don't, funny enough. I don't know anyone. Does anybody you know like have any ties to these? Because, like you were saying, like they're affecting people's, you know, friends and family and and brothers. Like, does anyone you know actually know people in there, or they're just kind of like these random people with no ties to anything? Yeah, I. There's so far there's no one that I know of that definitely knows them or any of the family members. That's how wow. crazy. Yeah. And there's no good and there's no good ones seemingly uh i believe out of 100 bad eggs or out of a lot of bad eggs there'll be good ones actually but i don't know of the good ones okay yeah that's that's crazy yeah um so just in doing my research i i saw that it takes a lot to kind of unite the Nigerian people and get everybody together. So what was it like to sort of see this unity amongst, you know, the entire country and everyone together in solidarity? Uh, you know, first of all, the Nigerian state is, you know, we have the Igbo, we have the Aousa, we have the Yoruba, like three major ethnic groups, you mm -hmm. know, different languages. And, you know, it's just like different beliefs. So it's more like they don't really understand each other for a while. Yeah. But, but when this started, you know, it was just a form of unity for everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we never expected this would happen. You know, the youths have not been this this um, connected to each other. We've not been connected to this kind of fight before. To them, they've just been, you know what, let me do my thing, let me do your thing. But we've not experienced this kind of unity before. And uh, I think it was because of this kind of issue that was what made every youth step up to their game and be like, you know what, we are the future leaders. In fact, we are the leaders. And if we don't stand up, these people are going to keep killing us and doing all sorts to us. Mm -hmm. so, right for us to stand up now for what is right and you know that point when you see one person standing two persons three more than 20 persons 40 and you know you know the consciousness yeah. that way and that was what happened you know then people in different states i mean lagos state here yeah, people in different states started growing from there from there from different states started standing up to what they believe is right and which is actually right and that was so, our stuff. So one thing kind of just popped into my head is there are there other um, racial groups in Nigeria? Like, is there a like a white population or an Asian population or is it strictly, you know, Africans in in the country? Yeah, strictly Africans. We, we, we have some whites, but just minimal number you get. So it's, let me say. We uh, uh if, if not more than ninety five percent. Yeah, because because my my question then would have been like, do does the SARS group, you know, antagonize those people too? Like, do they 
go after, you know, the white people, the Asian people, whoever it might be, you wouldn't know? No, not that I know of. I've not seen okay. any that yet. It's mostly, you know, it's like you um, antagonizing your your brothers. You guys are both black and you guys are doing wrong against each other. That's the way yeah. it is. Yeah. So as as far as you can remember back, has SWAT always, or SARS SWAT, has it always been this scary thing? Or was there a point when it was like, okay, um, and then it just got progressively worse? Yeah, I think it was progressively worse because it was actually um, set up in 1922, I guess, to combat um, crimes like um, robbery, kidnapping, mm. theft, stealing of cars, and the rest of it. But um, as time goes on, it grew into something else. You get so it grew into something else in which the government couldn't. I don't think the government could handle it anymore because it grew into them holding people for not doing things illegal. You know, they 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 started kidnapping people and the rest of it. So it was. I think it was a progressive thing. It was not meant to be like this. Yeah, I almost, from the way you guys are describing it, it just reminds me of like our equivalent over here of like the mafia or the mob. Like yeah. just just that that whole group of almost like this secret society of people who the government can't control, the regular police can't control, and they're just doing things at their own will. And it's like, all right, well, we can't stop them. We kind of just have to live with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I can imagine that is is super scary and, and tough to deal with. Uh, yeah, it's a crazy one, man. It's really been a crazy one. Um, so you, you wrote an article uh, for Rapzilla about the, the violence that happened last week. Yeah. Um, were you affected directly by that incident or was that close to you? Did you know anybody that was there? Uh. Actually, on that day, like few hours, just like I wrote in the article, few hours, mm -hmm. the government of the state stated that um, there would be a curfew. Yeah. And by 4 p.m., definitely everyone had to go inside. So you wouldn't have any reason to stay outside there. But um, owing to the way Lagos is, Lagos is where I stay, owing to the way it is, there's always mad traffic, like mad, mad traffic. So, mm. and the government made an announcement three hours before 4 p.m. So you're telling me someone who stays far, far away, how would they get to their destination? In right. So it's damn impossible. So, so some persons who were not able to go to their homes had to stay where they were. That was at the protest ground. So I, okay. wasn't, I wasn't there. So then immediately, there was an, a celebrity there at the protest ground alongside with them also. And she made mm -hmm. a live Instagram live video immediately about the shootings and the rest of it. And we could all see it. Yeah. Like the Instagram live video had over 100,000 views. Wow. Yeah, so it means like majority of the persons were watching and go, seeing what was happening. So that, that so that was it. People, most persons were not directly there, but some persons who couldn't go to their houses because of the curfew, because and they know going to their houses might be much harm. So they felt, you know what? Let me just stay. Right, here. right, yeah. My government can protect me. I have a reason for not going. You get my point. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Drew Bex is asking, um, is SARS on the government payroll? Yeah, sure. They're, it's it's a police unit. Right. It's a police unit. Like, it's it, you know, we have the police, but it's a unit of the police meant to tackle robbery and the rest of it. Yeah, so basically they the government would need to cut their funding to disband them. And I saw someone before that asked where are they 
are they purchasing their firearms from somewhere? They're not because they're part of the police force. So yeah. they're, they're being given the firearms to, uh, to do this stuff. Yeah. Which is crazy. All right, man. Well, I know, I know it's like what, two fifty five over there for you. Um, so I'll let you go. You look tired. Um, so real, real quick, you know, let actually let everyone know. I, and I should have done this myself, but you, you could do it so much better than me. Let everyone know what you do for Rapzilla with, with, uh, the playlist and, and everything, everything that you have going on. Okay. Okay. Um, just as I said, <laughs> my name is <laughs> Rishan Inusi. Um, I'm a writer, content creator, public relations, um, talent manager, artist manager, what else again? Uh, everything music, everything music. Man. And for basically for Rapzilla, I write, create contents for Rapzilla, also create playlists. And presently, we create Christian Rap Africa playlists showcasing Christian African acts from Africa. That's the guy. It's the guy who sparked the whole CHH Africa playlist. So very, I'm very grateful for that. and very thankful for that because you've, you've literally helped CHH um, cross the globe with that playlist. Super important. Uh, someone asked how long has the brutality been going on? Um, as long as it started, right? Yes, man. I could say it's, it's, it's close to a decade or even more than a year ago from five, six years ago. People coming out saying, oh, they've done this to me six years ago. They've done this to me four mm -hmm. years ago. It's more like close to a decade or even more than it. Right. All right. Where, where can everyone follow you real quick before you go? Okay. Olushala Adenusi, O-L-U-S-O-L-A-D-E-N-U-S-I on Instagram. And the same thing on Twitter with an underscore at the end of it. Man, I, pr I appreciate your, your hustle, your grind, and always letting us know what's up. Even, even if it's, even if it's like uh, six hours later from when we, from when we say something, because you're in the middle of the night <laughs> or in the middle of the day, depending on what's going on. Uh, but man, but man, I, I appreciate you. And thank you so much for, you know, helping all this all and arrange this man. Stay safe out there. Yeah. Thanks. And you too, man. All right, man. Take it easy. Yeah. All right. Peace. Yeah. yeah you too. Let's now go live with Chopay, who is Nigerian, but currently living in Toronto. And it'll be good to get that perspective to see what's happening for him to uh, give us his perspective of what's happening. Good to, good to meet you on the, on the face to face after posting so much of your, your music over the years. It's, it's good to like actually have this conversation. Likewise, man. Thank you so much for having me as a part of this. Thank you so much. Yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I give shout out to Alushola who was just on and he's like, you know, just going through the names of Nigerian artists and he's like, you know, it would be really dope to get Chopay on this episode too, uh -huh. you know, as a Nigerian over in North America to have this conversation. And I was like, right. yeah, that's a great idea because you can give a, a totally different perspective than, than people that are there as well. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So obviously with everything that's been going on, 2020 has, has been crazy for a variety of reasons. So before before diving into into what we've been talking about, what what's your 2020 been like so far? <sighs> <laughs> take, take your time. Um, we've all suffered from COVID in many different ways. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously, like the most immediate thing that comes to mind are career opportunities, if you will. So, mm -hmm. so I had some pretty pretty nice opportunity things that were supposed to happen this year that didn't happen due to cancellation so mm -hmm. uh, the juno awards which would be our equivalent of the grammys i was going to be a part of that whole festivity that got canceled um i was supposed to do some work with the um olympic canada team as part of the 2020 olympics oh wow yeah that got canceled as well so that didn't happen um and so there were a number of things career-wise that kind of fell out um my dad got COVID. <laughs> so oh, man. Was, so that was interesting. Uh, my dad and my sister-in-law got COVID, so that was definitely interesting to deal with. 
Um, and then the whole George Floyd thing, you know what I'm saying? Living on this part of the globe, um, you also sympathize with um, the plight of black North Americans. I'll say that. Whether it's black Canadians or black Americans, right. that's a stomach right. racism. So that was definitely very taxing to deal with because I do have family in the United States as well who are very susceptible to being the next George Floyd. Um, God forbid. So there was definitely a lot mentally and just trying to figure out how to serve and what role to play. <sighs> um, I had, it's just been a very, very tough year, man. It's been an extremely tough year. Some, um, some losses from friends close to me, family members passed away. Do you get what I'm saying? So that's also been very difficult to deal with. And then now the whole SARS situation as well. So um, I was just thinking through a couple of days ago, all of the different things that have happened this year. And but for the grace of God, it's 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 one crazy year, man. It's one crazy year. So, yeah, yeah a it's, lot. It's, it's like, what is this month going to throw at me? It's like, all right, now we're about to enter November. And it's like, right. oh, what, what do we got left? <laughs> like, what could possibly happen in November? And for America, actually, for the U.S., it's an election. So, so yes. I guess... That's yes. our next thing, and then we'll have to see what happens in December. Yes, <laughs> I, um, I do. I do not envy Americans right now, man. Yeah, I do not envy um, you guys. As your Instagram says, you are part of the diaspora of mm -hmm. Nigeria. Yeah, so, yeah. what what's it like watching everything that's going on there over here? It's on uh, this side. It's extremely heartbreaking. It's extremely heartbreaking because. Nigeria is a place that my family and myself immigrated from. So I was actually born in Nigeria mm -hmm. and I didn't immigrate to Canada until I was 11 years old. And so I have very vivid recollections and associations with the country, right? So even, even when we immigrated here, I've kept, I still have family there. I've still kept up as much as possible, more mm -hmm. so in the last maybe four or five years is what's going on. Um, and it's extremely heartbreaking because it is an, it is, it is in reality a culmination of a lot of the things that I had seen mm -hmm. um, while there. And I had also heard from my parents and also witnessed, as I said, when I visited as well. And so it's twofold. Number one, it's very disheartening. It's very heartbreaking because you're, you're literally seeing um, your home country go up in flames. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like I have... Yeah. I love Canada. I love Toronto. I'm grateful for the fact that we were adopted by this country, but there's still a strong sense of kinship that Nigeria in many ways is still home for me. Do you get yeah. what I'm saying? Nigeria is a place that I would love my kids to be able to choose to live if they want. Nigeria is a place that I'd love to take them to go say, come look at where Dada was born. Come look at the village where uh, grandpa was born and grandma was born. But at this point, it's very even difficult to show them that just because of all the chaos. So, on one hand, it's very discouraging and it's very disheartening. Um, and in a weird kind of way, I don't want to say it's hopeful, but I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope this is the beginning of the turn of the Nigeria that all Nigerians and those in the diaspora who have a heart for Nigeria have been praying for for a long time. We all know what Nigeria can be, right? Nigeria is the most um, densely populated country in Africa. Um, and the second largest economy, we could be the strongest economy in the entire continent, but we're second primarily because of a lot of mismanagement of resources and a lot of corruption. Do you get what I'm saying? But we have the highest population. We have one of the richest assets in the world, which is oil. Um, we have a number of other natural resources, but unfortunately, um, Nigeria is consistently ranked, world ranking, as one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Do you get what I'm saying? Wow. Um, for, for decades now, decades and decades. And so I see what's going on, and it's very discouraging to see the loss of human life. <sighs> but in some way, I'm hoping that this, this will be the turn that we all hope and believe um, would, will, will, will help Nigeria become the country we know it can be. Yeah, uh, Stephen just had a good question in the comments. Is there any hope for a solution practically, and could you explain how, if so? That's what I've been racking my brain to figure out, which you get what I'm saying. That's yeah. I've, I've literally been racking my brain, and I think, obviously, as, as Christians, we believe there's definitely a spiritual component to this, so shout out to 
Limo and Angelo for the prayer walks. Um, I, I, I do believe scripture also says religion that the father finds faultless is for care for orphans and widows in their time of need and to remain unstained from the world. So there's a very practical side. So yeah. one of the things I've been thinking about is that there are certain people in positions of power that need to be ousted. Right. Um, and I don't know how that's going to happen. Not only do those people need to be out, not only do they need to be ousted, certain maverick thinking individuals need to fill those positions. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. And I find that I think I think those in the diaspora, like myself, are going to be, play a critical role in connecting with those back home, right? So those in the diaspora can't presume to go home and save the country, if you will, but they're going to be invaluable because here's a here's a case study for you. China, for all of its woes, for all of the associations we have with China, how did China rise to becoming one of the world's superpowers and being on the heels of America? What they did was that they exported their students to the U.S., to the U.K., to all these Western countries to learn the systems that the Western countries have used to industrialize, right? Mm -hmm. For yeah. all of the police brutality and racial inequality that exists in the West, there is still something to be said for the fact that there's a working sense of, there's a working s system in place here. It's not something, perfect. Yeah, something's still happening and, and the cogs are still moving. Right, exactly. Like, I know who my local government official is, and I can call him up if I have a complaint. There's inequality in the system, but generally speaking, there are good officers. Like, there's things work. Do you get mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Things don't work back home. But how did China become the world superpower? They exported their students, and then they recalled them back home so that they would essentially learn and then come back and implement those things. And the country allowed them the creativity to do so. Nigeria needs to do that. But in order for that to happen, there are certain people that need to be forcefully ousted because there are a lot of people right now who benefit from the status quo. And they need to, I, I don't know how it's going to happen, but Steve, to your question, this is one of the things I'm, I'm racking my brain. I think there's going to have to be a huge, a strong sense of synchronicity between those in the diaspora who have a Western kind of thinking, not completely Western, with a strong connection to back home and then somehow partner to fill in these gaps to help uh, practically begin to change the system because it's not going to happen until certain individuals are taken out of office. Right. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. That 100% makes sense. And how, I guess, how, how different is your life here from what it was in Nigeria? Um, it's quite different. So one of the reasons my parents left, and my parents were pretty well educated, one of the reasons we left was because they saw what was happening, right, where you could be highly educated, um, a hard worker, but there's a lot of nepotism. Like there are literally individuals who get jobs simply because you're, t you're woefully unqualified for the position, woefully unqualified for the position, but you get it because your uncle knows this person. Yeah. Right? And it's not even... It's not even hidden. It's not covert. It's it's overt. It's in the open, right? Um, back home, even when I visited in 2019, between getting off the airplane and leaving the airport, I was stopped maybe four or five times by police officers, all looking for a bribe, all looking for money, all looking for me to give them something. Wow. That doesn't happen here, Right. I would stop many times in traffic and they have guns and you're like, what am I going to do? Am I going to swing him a couple of bucks so I can go about my day? Or am I going to take a step? Is this the hill I'm going to die on quite literally? Right? So none of that is happening right now in this part of the world. There's a, there's a real sense in which, again, I, I don't want to paint this system out to be perfect. However, there's a real sense in which that if you make yourself valuable in the marketplace, if you make yourself undeniable in the marketplace by acquiring some special skill, whether it's academically or with your hands or with some skill that you have, chances are you can carve out a pretty substantive living for yourself. Back home, there's no guarantee of such, right? Mm -hmm. Just because of the deep level of corruption, 
the deep level of, of poverty. Um, uh, Nigeria is such a pressure cooker of an environment that it, it, it really becomes a crab in a bucket type mentality. And I hate to speak about the country that I love this way, but that's absolutely what it is, right? I remember when I visited several years ago, I was thrown for a loop because I'm in traffic and this one's swerving, this one's jumping out of a car. There's traffic, so the bus driver's figures. The road is blocked, so I'm just going to drive on the sidewalk. He swerves onto the sidewalk. The pedestrian wow. has to dive into the bushes to avoid being hit by a car. And I was thrown for a loop. And I literally just turned to my dad and I said, how does this happen? Like, how do, how, like, how do we get to this place? And my dad just said, he said something. He said, you treat people like animals long enough. And unfortunately, they're going to start acting that way. And so you've had an incredibly corrupt government that has literally pillaged pillage to the coffers of the people they tax people and the money doesn't go towards social services it does not go towards economic development it does not go towards um, reforming the police system it does not go towards reforming the environment toward like the infrastructure and so you literally have people scraping and trying to carve out a living so every day is literally like a hustle like a life or death type situation you get what I'm saying? Right. Generally, I don't have that here. So there's a measure of comfort. There's a measure of peace of mind. I, again, I remember when I visited, I was there for about five weeks. And when I came back, it was almost like PTSD. Uh, the, my, 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 she's now my wife, but at the time we were dating. And I remember I came back and I was, I was extremely aggressive. I was extremely aggressive because you, you kind of have to become that kind of person. You're on, on edge. Which, you're on edge all the time all the time because you don't know if this person is going to try to screw you over. You don't know if this person is going to try to take your money. And so it becomes a defense mechanism. So when I came back here, it took me a couple of weeks to deprogram and go back to like, okay, listen, I don't have to yell to get something done. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Those are just some simple ways in which life is different here yeah. versus there. Now, what about in Canada? Like obviously the U S aside from COVID, which everyone has in common, much mm -hmm. of, our year has been focused on police brutality, Black Lives Matter, right, right. Um, and everything surrounding that. So what's that situation and, and the race situation like for you in Toronto or just, I guess, for the city in general? Right. Um, I mean, there is definitely symmetry between Canada and the United States. However, however um, I want to say our sort of takes on a different flavor. So there, there definitely has been a history of profiling of people of color by uh -huh. the police system. Um, Toronto as a whole, well, let me speak for Toronto, and I mean all of Canada, right, is right. very, uh, very intentional in trying to root it out. Do you get what I'm saying? So the government will make these claims and they'll attempt to root it out. In Canada, I, I guess our situation with the Aboriginals is more akin to the U.S.'s relationships with Black Americans. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So Canada has a history of oppressing Black people, of course. However, it has an even more sordid history of oppressing the Aboriginals, right? So a lot of our messaging that you hear is um, reconciling and making right a lot of the mistakes and a lot of the oppressive practices that were levied against Aboriginals, right? And, and yes, you will hear... Um, you will hear um, the establishment of committees and boards that are designed to try to root out systemic racism um, across different levels of government. So, for example, in the education system right now, one of the things that they realize is, I don't know if you know what streaming is, but streaming is, is basically at a very early age, they'll assess students and say, based on your level of achievement, you are, you're going to go down this path versus you, you're going to go down this path. And what okay. happens is that one path leads to university, college, um, generally a more successful life, if you will. And in the other one, students are streamed at a very young age into kind of like low achieving careers, right? And what they found was this was disproportionately streaming Black students, students of color, into the lower careers and lower earning potentials, right? And so this was something that they discovered and they said, okay, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to eliminate streaming. We're going to get rid of streaming and try yeah. to find a different way to assess academic aptitude in students, right? So there's definitely the conversation of racial, of racial equity in, in Canada uh, because we do get some of that as well. But, but our conversation tends to skew more heavily toward 
that of reconciling with the aboriginals and dealing with the sins of of um the country's forefathers as it were so when you say when you say aboriginals do you mean like the natives that yeah. that were there before so like native yes. americans because yeah, when i think aboriginal First you know Nations. i think yeah i think of like the indigenous people in yeah. australia sorry yeah, which, which are not native american you know yeah, First Nations. So um, I, when I say Aboriginals, I'm using it, using it as a synonym for First Nations, okay. Indigenous, um, Inuit, Métis, the, the individuals who were here before we, okay, not, not we, but before <laughs> the Canadians came yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's what I figured because, uh, yeah, Drew Beck says we call them First Nations in Canada. Yeah. In the U.S., in the U.S., they're Native Americans. I, I, I feel like I feel like there's a, a First Nation sort of transition going on for us to that that'll be more common ground but the only time it's interesting because the only time i've ever heard aboriginal or aborigine is when dealing with you know the, in the first nation yeah. people of australia or new zealand right, right so then i was right. like so i was like wait a second yeah, my but i got I, it I, no I no no i got it interchangeably i was just just clarifying for for myself so with with race sort of being the polarizing issue in the u.s Right. Uh, I know that you said the First Nation issue is kind of your thing, but is there another polarizing issue that's a constant, like controversy or debate that's happening? Um, I mean, it's very similar, man. There's a culture war. If you think of what a right. lot of the the hot button issues that um, are heavily debated and discussed in the U.S., they're heavily debated and discussed here as well, right? We yeah. tend to be Canada as a whole tends to be very liberal um liberal leaning um and so like a lot of the same conversations you're gonna you're gonna hear on this side as well okay yeah and, and steve steve you asked that question i had i had a sort of similar question yes so I'll, I'll group them together so aside from resources which maybe you can plug some of that do you have any plans on your own you know as an artist to do something creative for nigeria whether it be you know, music or initiatives or, or whatever. And can you talk about that? Hundred percent, hundred percent. First, to Steve's question, um, "Journey of an African Colony" is on Netflix. It describes how Nigeria became Nigeria, just historically. Blow your mind, eye-opening. Um, I also recently ordered a book that was recommended to me. I haven't read it yet, though. But I was it was recommended to me as like, wow, this is very good to learn about how Nigeria's. Um, leadership structure works and it's called this house has fallen so those are two immediate resources you can easily look up to um, journey of an african colony and this house has fallen i think it's by eric eric flair something like that i'll check it out so those are two places to immediately start yeah it's on canadian netflix as well so if it's on canadian netflix it might be on the u.s netflix if not just get a vpn i was gonna say yeah <laughs> just just switch i just got a vpn that thing is awesome just get a vpn so those those are Started the Netflix thing. It's easily digestible. It'll blow your mind as to just the level of wickedness and that humans are capable of and how the country became the country. Um, and do I plan to do anything for Nigeria? Absolutely. Um, anyone who's been following my career would realize that um, I'm making Afrofusion music now. So I transitioned mm -hmm. from making strictly hip hop and R&B to Afrofusion. Um, and, and that this has been, um, this process has been two years in the making. What are we, 2020? Yeah, uh, two, in let me say in earnest two years in the making, but in reality, I kind of like mentally began back in 2013, a series of things happened that caused me to begin to want to reconnect more with Nigeria. Right. Cause I immigrated when I was 11, I left Nigeria yeah. when I was 11 and kids, kids are, are cruel. Right. So I was teased. I was mocked. I got all the jokes. Like, what was it like living in a tree? What's it like seeing a car? So when I immigrated here, what that caused me to do for the first couple of years was not to value my African heritage, if you get what I'm saying. And right. I was quick to distance myself from it and just quickly assimilate. Uh, but then over the years, several things started happening. One of them was beginning to see <laughs> the racial inequity in the system, right? Because when you're Nigerian looking out at the West, you see the, you see the, the movies, you see the TV shows and you think like, man, it's so amazing. I just want to go over there. And then you come here and it's like, it's like anything you stay there long enough, you begin to see the imperfections. Right. And I began to realize that, Oh man, there's actually some kinks here and there's systemic racism here and there's something amiss here. At the same time, all the while I was, we've been living here. My dad kept saying to me, Chopin, like, 
we're grateful for Canada. We're grateful for Canada, but don't forget that you're not from here. You're from Nigeria. Do you get what I'm saying? <laughs> so that yeah. message was kind of like always circulating in the back of my mind. Um, and then I had my son. And that was kind of like a light bulb moment. I was like, oh, man, I, I want you to know where you're from. I want you to know where your dad is from. Absolutely. So that, kind of, that kind of began the process of me saying, you know what? I have to reconnect back to my roots. I have to. And so in 2013, when I visited I slowly been in like embodying myself more of the culture. And so I made this transition to start making Afro fusion music now that blends Nigerian Afro beat, which is my Nigerian side with my hip hop and R and B, which is my Western Toronto side. And so everything about my music, everything about my imaging, everything about what I do right now is meant to really, really empower and amplify so. Nigeria and the African voice because Africa as a whole has given so much to global development, to global civilization, and it's appalling. It is absolutely appalling that a country, that a continent that is so rich in resources, so rich in human capital, so rich in human contribution is lagging behind economically um, and in so many ways, right? And so I intend to use my voice to help bring some spotlight you know what i'm saying and to show the beauty that is in africa and so mm-hmm. help me god so help me god it'll extend beyond music right so outside of music i have a big heart for education i have a big heart for many other things for commerce and for business and so the hope is that music can be a springboard that will then open more more opportunities for me to actually invest in the country of nigeria and in Africa in the long run. So at this stage, I'm just looking for the right partners, looking for the right people to connect with um, who can help further this vision of really trying to get Nigeria to where I, where I know it can be. Dope, man. That that sounds amazing. I think that's a that's a great point uh, part to end it too. I mean, does, does, anybody, does anybody in the comments have any questions for Chopay uh, before, before we let him go? Man, you hit us like so efficiently with like really good information. It was like yeah. compact, boom, boom. This is what you need to know. Yeah, thank you and- guys for doing this, man. Thank you guys for doing this. I know Rabzilla has been intentional in the last couple of years of really opening up like the African space. Um, and mm-hmm. that's that's critical. That's critical because there's so much beauty, man. Like there's so much beauty. Wakanda is fiction, but it's not it's not like <laughs> it, it, it's not a distant fiction. Like that's the crazy thing about it. Right. It's yeah. not like an, an, an unrealistic fiction. Literally everything, every resource for any aspect of life, minerals, metals, you, you find in Africa. You literally do. You yeah. literally do. Right. And so. I think it's very important that Africa gets its shine because we're also made in the image of God. Yeah. Somebody asked what, what is, what was the name of the documentary again? Journey of an African colony. Uh, Yeah. And to, to your point, to your point, to what you were just saying, like the whole goal of, of this show, this is episode 21. So I've just been speaking to a ton of people. You're the, you're the 63rd person I've spoken to in, in 21 wow. weeks. Wow. So it, it, you know, it was sparked from, from what happened with George Floyd. And I'm like, how can we have these important conversations? You know, as you get further and further away from that, it's important, you know, not to forget that, but also there's, there's going to be other things that are happening and there's going to be right. other issues. We're constantly, unfortunately, going to be this community during right. a chaos. So what's that chaos going to look like in, in 2021 or, you know, next month or in two months? So I kind of wanted to be able to to pivot a little bit and be like, hey, there's something going on in Nigeria. That's a community in chaos. Right. Let's talk about that because we haven't done that yet. That's amazing. Um, so, That's amazing. That's amazing. And yeah, it just op- it, it expands everybody's minds. Like you said, um, the world exists outside of the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think it's important for people to realize that. You should get what I'm saying? Um, because then what it also does is that it causes you to begin to value what you do have, right? There's poverty and then there's poverty. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like there's oppression and then there's oppression. And I'm not mm-hmm. just trying to be funny when I say that. But if I'm dead broke in Canada, okay, chances are I can, I can still live. I don't know what it's like in the U.S., because there's some social service, whether it's food stamps or coupons or whatever. If I'm poor in Nigeria, I will die. That's not even, I will literally die or become a criminal. Yeah. Like it's a different, it's a different, it's just a 
different ball game. I was having this conversation with someone today. Like you have people who are like, oh, I'm dead broke, but they have an iPhone or <laughs> right. wh- whether, whether it's a new one or not, like they still have a phone. Um, you know, That's they have, fact. they, they might have, you know, Jordans You have or, shoes or on. they have, they have shoes on, they have clothes. Uh, you know, they go home. It's like, ah, oh, man, I got to eat ramen. But like you have ramen, you have ramen, <laughs> right. Where you're dealing with, you know, abject poverty in in africa or you know one of the islands like haiti Mm -hmm. or even dominican republic or whatever like these people sometimes have absolutely nothing right whatever whatever they're wearing if they're even have that left right and and then you're fighting those people who are supposed to be out to get who's are supposed to help you like it's you get what i'm saying so this should be a good education in, in global perspective for everyone to realize that yes Work for the good of where God has placed you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Nowhere is perfect. But at the same time, think of your brothers and think of your sisters who have it worse than you. Give glory to God for what you have. And as much as you're able, seek to do good to your neighbor. Dope, man. All right, real quick, throw throw some plugs out. Where can people find you? Uh, You know, listen Um, to your music. Yeah, all of Chopin, A-L-L-O-F-S-H-O-P-E. Um, here on Instagram, on Twitter, uh, Facebook. Um, I just put out a new EP called Rikiki, uh, or Rikiki, depending on what part of the world you're from. <laughs> <laughs> All the links are in my bio. Um, yes, I'm here. Thank you guys so much, man. I love Rapzilla. You guys have been there since since I started this thing. So, yeah, all of Chopin everywhere. Man, thank you. Appreciate you so much. Thanks for jumping on and dropping some knowledge. Uh, for everybody who's watching, if, if you missed any part of this show, um, this will be right on our IG post, right on our feed, right after we're done with this. You can watch it back. Uh, man, thank you so much. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Thank you for having me. All right, man. Good night. Good night. All right. So that was Show Pay. This was a super good of community during chaos. Um, thank you, everyone who was in the chat. Um, pretty consistent group of people that I've seen in here and asking questions and engaging. A special shout out to Limo Blaze, Alushola, and Chopay for, for dropping some knowledge about something that a lot of us in the U.S., including myself, really didn't know about. Um, and it's good to learn about these other parts of the world because, you know, we are not just in this bubble of our own country. You know, the whole world's going through COVID. The whole world is seemingly going through some sort of unrest. And it's good to hear people from other places talk about it these similarities that we have, and there's actually unity in that, which is super dope. Um, Here's a quick announcement. Next week for episode 22, right now, as I just confirmed today, we will have Fizzle on the episode. So that's super exciting. I don't know who else is going to be with him, but please tune in next week for episode 22. Again, thank you everyone for watching, and uh, I will see you all next week. Peace.